The Retron 5 is an Android-based multi-console released by Hyperkin in 2014. It uses a customized version of RetroArch to emulate your physical collection of retro, cartridge-based consoles on your modern TV. It uses HDMI and displays in 720p. Featured on the console are 5 cartridge slots and 6 controller ports. You're able to mix and match if you like. The user can run NES, Super Nintendo, all Famicoms, all Game Boys, and Sega Genesis games. With an adapter, sold separately, you can even play Sega Master System, Master Card, and Game Gear games. There's also the ability to play patched games with community IPS files. Whether it be ROM hacks, translations, the Retron 5's got you covered with its included SD card slot. You can also load in cheats, which is your alternative for the unsupported cheat cartridges. Internal storage size is 3GB, which is mostly for storing saved data. With the provided firmware, there is no way to load stored ROMs on the device. The standard version sells for 155 USD or 230 CAD. These days, there are many choices for retro gaming in a modern environment, but in 2014, options were limited, so it made sense to buy a Retron to revisit the old collection, play in HD, or just to sell your existing consoles that are taking up space. Myself leaning towards minimalism these days, I've been wondering if the Retron 5 could serve as a suitable replacement. After the usual rundown, I'll be trying out custom firmware, which unlocks some hidden potential, including loading ROMs from an SD card, and access to TurboGrafx-16 or PC Engine games. First things first, I'd like to mention the Retron 5's official Bluetooth controller, which comes bundled with it. I don't have one anymore, mine died after several uses. Yeah, these things are pretty unreliable, but that's okay because nobody seems to use it anyways. It's uncomfortable, the buttons are cheap, and it uses a micro-switch thumbstick instead of a D-pad, which might be okay for fighters, but not great for retro gaming as a whole. It used to fit nicely in this slot on the back, which I guess inspired its unusual form factor. The system won't connect to any other Bluetooth controllers by default. There is a tutorial out there for connecting 8-bit do controllers, though it seems a bit touchy. I'll leave that video in the description. You can also use an 8-bit do retro receiver for other Bluetooth controllers. For me personally, I'm okay with using the retro wired controllers. There's no menu button on them, but luckily, you can use the shortcut down and start to access it all the same. Of the available controllers, Super Nintendo has the most buttons, so let's use that. I'll just take this dust cover off first. It's very nice that they thought of this. The cartridge slots are also covered, although not the Game Boys for some reason. I guess you could use a DS's GBA slot cover, but it sticks out a bit. Anyways, let's power it on. It's got a nice silent boot sequence, followed by a simple, effective menu system. As you can see, no card is inserted currently. I would start with Famicom games, but I don't have any, so we'll begin our testing with an NES game like Balloon Fight. I love this blue light that shows you which system you've inserted a cartridge for. That's nice attention to detail. One thing that's often criticized about the Retron 5 is what's been called the death grip on cartridges. These old carts can be delicate, and they're also collector's items, so having to yank them out with such force is a bit scary. More recent reviews imply that the issue was fixed in future revisions, however in my case... Yep, the concern has been validated. When looking online, I read a few suggestions of a better way to take them out. You have to grip on the left or right side instead of pulling directly from the middle. Hmm, it does seem like an improvement. If the newer models do have better pin tech, maybe one day I'll replace this one with the Hyper Beach model. That thing looks terrible and awesome at the same time, I need it. So I played a good half hour of Balloon Fight. Despite using a Super Nintendo controller, it felt close enough to the real thing. Controller inputs responded quickly, and there were no sound issues that I noticed. Keep in mind that the Retron 5 does use emulators, so this can differ between platforms. Checking out the in-game menu, I found the ability to add scan lines, or use one of six different filters. The scan lines are meant to resemble a CRT display. Artificial scan lines are a bit controversial in the retro gaming community, but I'd say they're not bad on the Retron 5. For Balloon Fight it doesn't make a huge difference since it's mostly black anyways, but we'll try some others shortly. Most retro emulators have some kind of filters to play around with. I'm glad they're here, though I don't often use them myself. Some games can look okay with certain filters, but others, usually the more pixelated ones, tend to give off a smeared Vaseline look. The original games still look great the way they were released, even without CRT scan lines, so it's up to you ultimately. I suggest experimenting with different games because it's not all bad. 
along with save states, which work fine as you'd expect. These were the available in-game options. There are some other things that you can access through the Retron 5's main menu, we'll look at that stuff later. Perhaps you're curious about the use of flash carts on this thing. As you can see with my NES EverDrive here, no dice. You see, the Retron 5 dumps every game that you insert, then emulates its ROM from memory. The games you'll find on a flash cart are not stored in the ROM, hence it doesn't work. There are many reproductions and homebrew games which apparently work, although it's considered to be hit or miss. I don't have any to test with, not for these systems anyways. Might as well mention that the Super Game Boy also doesn't work, although with the built-in Game Boy slot, I suppose that doesn't matter too much. I've found this compatibility list for the Retron 5. A vast majority of retail games work, but there are some that don't, so you might want to take a look at this thing before making a purchase. I'll leave a link to that in the description. Having two cartridges in at once means you can't play either, so let's take that out and try some Super Nintendo. First I tried to get Yoshi's Island to work. The Retron 5 has a database that recognizes games by title. However, this one came up as an unknown cartridge. Remember the days of putting in a cartridge and getting nothing but a black screen? Basically the same thing's happening here. Next try, and it tells me, Error failed to dump ROM. Okay, admittedly this cart's seen better days, I mean what the heck happened here? Oh, there it is. Yoshi's Island ran similarly to original hardware, with some familiar slowdowns in heavily populated areas. Unfortunately, there is noticeable input lag with this one. Nothing crazy, but enough to mistime a flutter jump and fall into a pool of lava. Played around with the filters a lot in this game. It's one of a few that looks alright with them. How about Donkey Kong Country? This one I had to wiggle around in the slot for it to be recognized. Guess the previous owner played a lot of Super Nintendo. Besides input lag, Donkey Kong Country played fine. I don't think this is a great game for filters. These are 3D sprites converted to 2D, so no big surprise. Scan lines help to get rid of the game's cut and paste look. Yeah, I always preferred this one on a CRT. In theory, since the Retron 5 saves the ROM to its memory, we don't need the cartridge to stay inside, right? Actually, by intention you do. If the cartridge is removed mid-game, shown here in Donkey Kong Country, it says error, cartridge was removed. It's nice to know that the usual issues with cartridges or dying hardware aren't going to be a problem here. For example, your game probably won't crash if for some reason your console hits the floor. With it already loaded into memory, all that matters is that the cartridge stays inserted. Both Yoshi's Island and Donkey Kong Country loaded up without using their existing saves. Are the cart batteries dead? Or is the Retron 5 not loading them for some reason? Ah, that's why. There's an option related to this in the main menu system settings. Automatically import saves on first run. This makes for a good time to go over that menu. There are several different sections. The first is video, where you can change the game's aspect ratio, resolution, refresh rate, and more. The audio section lets you tinker with various sound enhancements. The controller section lets you customize mappings. The system section has the biggest variety of settings, from automatic loading to screenshots and save data locations. You can even erase saves if you need to with its file manager. Time for the Sega Genesis. How about Ristar? Can't complain, seems to run just fine without noticeable input lag. Feels sacrilegious to play a Genesis game with a Super Nintendo controller, but it plays great. After some time, I enabled scan lines, and I think Ristar looks better with them on. Here's a game I'm more familiar with, Sonic the Hedgehog 3. Let's see if I can dump the save from the combination of 3 and Knuckles. Well, the first couple of tries didn't work, but it was eventually recognized and dumped just fine. I've just preserved my save game file from 2005. Wow. Nostalgic. While playing, I noticed a few subtle sound differences and the occasional wrong note, but if I wasn't so experienced with the game, I probably wouldn't have noticed. Oh! Well, that's just one instance. I don't even know what this is, but either way, the game plays fine. How about Duke Nukem 3D Come to Brazil Edition? It's a Mega Drive game that works fine on a local system, and the Retron 5 as well. There's more Sega to play with an adapter, but first, let's finish up the included systems. Now we have Game Boy, Game Boy Color, and Game Boy Advance. The only Game Boy game I have on hand is Super Mario Land 2. Besides the one time it listed as an unknown cartridge, it ran great. No input lag across the Game Boys that I noticed. Please don't use filters though, oh my god, it's awful. Here's the last built-in system, Game Boy Advance. Let's start off with Yoshi Topsy Turvy, a game where you have to tilt the system to adjust the landscape. 
Oh no, not again. Since the Retron 5 dumps and emulates the ROM, it doesn't use the cartridge's ball bearing, so as of this screen, it's unplayable. How about Rayman Raving Rabbids on the Game Boy Advance? As expected, 2D games aren't gonna suffer, but 3D games are where it can get iffy. I happen to own two, Duke Nukem and Serious Sam. Duke Nukem ran flawlessly. I've had issues with this game before on other emulators. Never Serious Sam though, so that shouldn't be a problem. I am mistaken. The frame rate often dips to about half, and by the third level it's essentially unplayable. This isn't the most stable game on the platform by any means, but it was never this bad. Hopefully we can end on a higher note with Yoshi's Island. Again. Yeah, I've got nothing to say. Runs as good as ever. Here's where things get interesting with the 3-in-1 adapter. It lets you play Sega Master System, Master Card, and Game Gear games. Having played Master System on this before, I assure you that that worked fine. All I've got with me now are a couple Game Gear games. When I first bought this adapter, I was a bit spooked because it didn't seem to be working. The problem was that it doesn't load on stock firmware. If you're using the original model like I am, you'll need to download firmware 2.53039 or above on their website. You can install it using an SD card. So, I have to admit that this thing makes the Retron 5 look pretty ugly. Especially when you put in a Game Gear or card game. They just obtrude from the side. I mean, if it works, I guess. And it does for the most part. I've got three Game Gear games. Two of them worked fine, but the third one, Castle of Illusion starring Mickey Mouse, is unplayable. The graphics load incorrectly, and no controller input is recognized. According to a thread I found, the Game Gear version is more or less the Master System ROM in a Game Gear's shell. This version of the game is difficult for some emulators. Looks to be the same situation here, so let this serve as a reminder that its emulation is not perfect. For full, 100% compatibility, it's best to look elsewhere. In case you're wondering, I have tried this adapter in a real Sega Genesis before. Believe it or not, Game Gear games actually do load on certain models. My only Genesis now is a Nomad, and it doesn't work at all on one of those. But on a Model 1, the color palette's messed up, and controller inputs are unrecognized. Pretty much the exact same thing that happened earlier with Castle of Illusion. Perhaps you're wondering about the Retron 5's multiplayer capabilities. How's that work? On the left side of the console you have Player 1's inputs, and on the right side, Player 2's inputs. You can plug in however many controllers you want. NES, SNES, Genesis... They're all recognized at once in their corresponding side. Not that you'd ever need more than one, though. That's all that needs to be said about multiplayer. If you're not big on collecting, but still want to play some old multiplayer classics with your friend or significant other, the Retron 5 isn't a bad choice. Now, before we get into custom firmware, there's something I should probably mention about the Retron 5, and that's the legal controversy. It was discovered shortly after release that the emulator cores being used in the Retron 5 were not legally licensed. Several people who worked on these cores were quite unhappy to find them used here. I was unable to find any sort of resolution for this. As far as I can tell, the Retron 5, which continues to be sold on the Hyperkin website, still uses unlicensed cores. Perhaps I'm wrong, though, because the last mention I can find of this dates back to 2018. Either people gave up and stopped talking about it, or maybe a deal was made behind the scenes. So that just about covers the Retron 5 itself. Now, as promised, let's take a look at custom firmware. Firstly, ever heard of the Retro Freak? It's another multi-console which is often compared to the Retron 5 for its similarities. One notable feature about the Retro Freak was that it could read ROMs from an SD card without requiring an inserted cartridge. In 2019, homebrewer ManCloud managed to dump the Retro Freak and ported the firmware to Retron 5. Suitingly, he's called this project Retron Freak. Retron Freak gives the Retron 5 a better user interface, and yes, the ability to read ROMs from an SD card. Also included, PC Engine and TurboGrafx-16 emulation. If more emulators are what you're looking for, you might want to check out a different custom firmware called Retron Labo. It adds new systems like the TurboGrafx-16, WonderSwan, and even PlayStation 1. I've got enough methods of playing those games already. I just wanted a better interface and ROM loading, so I'm going with Retron Freak. To install, I used a tutorial by RetroRGB. Link in the description. Be aware that there is a chance that this can brick your system, but there's an unbricking tutorial there as well if you need it, which isn't too difficult to follow. After spending a couple of hours with the Retron Freak custom firmware, I can definitely say it's an improvement. The user interface looks much less basic than the Retron 5's. 
I like the menu sounds as well. In terms of options, functionality is practically identical. You can use the same filters, scan lines, and all the rest as far as I can tell. Accessing the in-game menu is just as easy, using the same button combination of down plus start. In regards to loading ROMs off an SD, you'll need to create console subfolders in a folder called RetroFreak. And that's it! Insert the SD card, wait about a minute, and you'll be able to select between the associated consoles listed on the right. Pick one, and select your game. One feature I love is how when you leave a game, it creates a state that automatically loads the next time you play. And this is regardless of whether you've since powered off the console. It also creates a thumbnail image of the latest frame, so prior to loading, you get a glimpse of where you left off. With the new firmware installed, I tried many of the same games as before, and some others to test capabilities. Many homebrew games and hacks worked, but not everything. Tried a few hard hitters like Doom and Star Fox on the Super Nintendo. Feels to run similarly to real hardware. No issues with the simpler stuff, as expected. Being able to load hacked ROMs without having to patch them is a huge plus in my book. Previously on the Retron 5, I had difficulties running Serious Sam Advance. I suppose Retro Freak uses a different core, because those issues didn't persist here. It's playable. And so is Yoshi Topsy Turvy with an LNR tilt hack. TurboGrafx 16 games work great, no complaints. How about input lag? Has that gotten any better? Yeah, remarkably so. I was shocked when playing Donkey Kong Country again. It's almost perfect. Let's try Game Gear's Castle of Illusion again. I'm extra curious about this because I'm using a Retron 5 adapter with RetroFreak firmware. Well that's interesting. I get an error message saying cartridge power fault detected. By using a ROM, I loaded up the game, and it ran just fine. One question you might have is, does this custom firmware allow you to dump your cartridges onto the SD card? Apparently yes, so let's try dumping the Super Nintendo version of Donkey Kong Country 2. What do you know, now I've got an excellent ROM dumper. So, do I recommend getting a Retron 5? If you're not a diehard retro gamer, then sure, this is a comfy way to play those old cartridges with the right controller. Granted, there are some alternatives you might want to consider. I went from thinking this thing was just okay to pretty awesome after installing the custom firmware. But what do you think? Is it worth the time? Let me know in the comments. Stay tuned for the next video, where I'll be using the Retron 5 for a second run of Rayman's Game Boy Advance games. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to hear more from me in the future, consider subscribing to the channel. See you next time!